I was a nurse in the Vietnam War from 1967 through 1968. I served in Third Field Hospital as a triage nurse. I wrote letters, I kept journals, and I've always found them hard to read because I'm still trying to pick up the pieces. October 1968, Third Field Hospital. The last sense that goes is hearing. Talk to them, not about them. To them, like they're the people you're with. We tell the incoming nurses that. Talk to them until they're gone, and after too. We always did, if there was time. I always did. I'm standing on a battlefield, looking out at hospital beds scattered through the field. Slowly, the way it happens in dreams, I begin to move from bed to bed. Under each bloody sheet is a boy. I tape his dog tags to his chest, tag the toe, and as I pull the now completely clean sheet over him, I say, I pronounce you dead. This goes on for a while, until I come to a body I recognize, shattered in pieces. It's me. The bed should be soaked in blood, but there is none. I pick up the limbs, shake them, look inside, nothing. Then I begin taping parts back together into a body. As I pull the clean sheet up, I say, I pronounce you empty. For a long time, I work over the dead. But each time I look back at my gurney, my sheet is saturated in blood. Again and again, I go back to change it. But now, body parts are coming loose. The blood can't be stopped, and I have no idea where it's coming from. The pieces keep coming apart. Most people wanted to hear the good news, like how we were winning the war. (laughs) That was a joke. We were hip deep and wounded, okay? My family wanted to hear about the fun stuff, like my travel plans. Yeah, well, my travel time was on medevacs, dust-offs, picking up wounded, usually under fire. If you were lucky, maybe a night out for dinner in Saigon, before curfew, And I used to carry a small gun in my handbag. I mean, let's face it, we were in a war zone. Lois was the only one back home who really wanted to know. Saigon, March 67. Hi, Lois. We're on alert for a push tomorrow. By morning, casualties will be coming in. A lot of them. On trucks and choppers. The guys spook easily at night on the wards when you're turning out the lights. They lose themselves. So walking quietly up to someone's bed is not a good idea. You can easily set them off. Any sudden movement could rip out a chest tube, and you don't want that happening. So you tell them, you know, I'm a nurse, coming on rounds. You're in a hospital. At night they're awake, alert. These guys have been in the field so they're instinctively aware of any movement. You know how I told you sometime I sing to the guys while I'm working on the ward? They seem to like that. And the other night, this guy was asking for a lullaby. He likes that one. Lullaby and good night. Da-da-dum-da-da-da-da. Anyway, we're light right now. Only about 30 people on the ward. And lo and behold, it's one o'clock in the morning, 
everyone's IVs and dressings changed. They're settling down, and I started singing. And some of the men in the beds joined in. Not all. Some were delirious. Some were just smiling, because they have their mouths wired shut. We have a lot of head wounds right now. You know, here it is, late at night. The lights are out, and all through the ward, you hear these guys singing. Lullaby and good night. Mm -hmm. And all through the ward, these guys are singing in the dark. There was always enough blood, as the Scottish doctor said in the killing fields, just in the wrong place, or soaking through your scrubs into skin till you were drenched in it for hours, and no matter how much water, it felt like it would never wash off. Blood has a metallic smell, very different, say, from infection. I had a peculiar sensitivity to infection. They'd send me through a ward and I'd know. I could smell it out. The body is an amazing thing. How it can heal. How it can hurt. Burns were the worst. I remember the first mass casualties with burns. Jesus Christ. You'd get these guys caught in APCs, armored personnel carriers. They hit landmines, and they're totally fried. You can't believe what you're seeing. Guys blowing up in front of you like balloons, heads inflating to the size of basketballs. Eyelids, lips, rolled back. Just not possible. The body is an amazing. The, bo the body. And the smell. We kept a bucket by the bed to throw up in while we worked over them. To find some surface that isn't charred black, to get an IV in for fluids. You can't believe how fast you have to move and not flood the kidneys or the whole renal system will shut down. So they can either drown in their own fluids or suffocate from this rapid expansion of tissue. And there's no time. A surgical tracheotomy would cost them their life. So often you do an emergency trach, which basically means stabbing a hole into the throat so they can breathe. And doing that on someone who's going into shock expanding in the moment. Think about it. They don't always make it. Mostly they don't. I remember this one guy who came in. The only thing that wasn't charred black on the entire surface of his body were the soles of his feet, which were pink, completely healthy, like the palm of my hand. The body is an amazing thing, an amazing the body. Phosphorus burns were the worst. They burn down like a fire. You can watch it through layers of tissue, and it just keeps burning. If you don't have the right salve, you can't do a thing for them. And if it gets on you, you burn too. Needless to say, this salve was at a premium and we often ran out. Fortunately, that guy died fast. Like I say, most of them do. Or we'd make the call. Let them go. Yeah. Phosphorus burns were the worst. I dream we are in the monsoons. The Saigon River is overflowing, 
and the hospital is waist high with water, rats, sewage. It starts to take the wounded. I can't hold them back. Soon the current is too strong. I lose my balance, and like the rats and men, I float away. Somewhere downstream, we wash up on a muddy delta. The enemy is waiting. They cut out our hearts, and then our eyes. Then it goes dark. There's this other guy who really likes show tunes. Every time I do his dressings, especially at night, he wants me to sing to him. If I loved you, remember that one? And the other one? I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Those are his two favorites. His name is Davy. Sometimes he hums along while I'm doing his dressings. I get the feeling his mom sang to him. He just loves it. He's a kid, eighteen. I don't think he's going to make it. He's a very sick guy, head to toe injuries. But we always end the night with, "I'll be seeing you." I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. I didn't want to be a nurse. I wanted to sing. Once for a while, I had a four octave range. It was a gift. Nothing I had anything to do with. It's gone now. Left somewhere in Vietnam. Our house, growing up, was built like a concrete bomb shelter. My own little concert hall. Sometimes in the summer, I'd open up the French doors and just sing for hours. And I remember once looking up and seeing the neighbors standing in the backyard listening. Later, I sang in concerts in churches with orchestras. I wrote my own stuff. That was my passion. Yeah, what Maria Callas did for a living. That was what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a nurse. I wanted to. Sing. May, San Francisco, 1985. You hear them long before you see them. Heat, grease, rotor blades, wind. Choppers. There are these incredibly still moments just before incoming wounded arrive. After all the scurrying around to get ready, operating rooms, post-op, blood, IVs, all the stuff we do before the choppers and trucks get to triage. All these med people just standing, ready, at doors and windows, looking out, watching, suspended, and there's this deep, deep stillness. Then an incredible explosion of sound, screaming, trucks offloading wounded, orders shouted over the chaos, bodies loaded onto gurneys, your own body crashing through those big metal doors into surgery, the wind they create as they swing, yelling for blood over their cries and wailing, for IVs, giant scissors to cut off their fatigues, the relentless nature of it, body after body, sometimes for days. You don't look out and see somebody closing the gates to the compound, saying, "That's it, folks," because there's no frame of reference and no closing credits. And after a while, you start thinking, maybe there is no end. How many people can you kill? I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places. Part of mine. Late in my tour, I see a guy coming towards me. It's dusk, triage filled with wounded, lots of trucks with bodies, a lot of people milling around. 
He seems older. Does that mean 26? Moving towards me, holding something under his arm. Something tells me to register that he's missing an arm, that he found it during the attack, and now he's carrying it with him. He's drenched in blood. I'm moving now, as quickly, towards him. We constantly ask them the same question. Was it an ambush? Landmine? Mortar attack? Do you remember? Because their answers are invaluable clues to how you treat maybe an entire unit. He thinks it was a grenade. Says he was lucky the arm was close by. And I know it's sheer adrenaline keeping him standing. Cupped in his hand, he holds out his testicles and asks me if I can put them back on. I tell him quickly, yes, somebody can, that he's here, he's safe, we'll do everything we can for him. I know he's on the edge of shock, about to pass out. We move through the triage doors. I carry his balls and arm. The Corps men are there. They catch him as he drops. They call Saigon the Paris of the Orient. Did you know that, Lois? Even with all the squalor, you can see the big, wide boulevards, beautiful old French colonial buildings, shattered now, bombed out. How exquisite it must have been before the war. Before the wars. So, Lois, I wonder what is being reported back there. We don't get any real news, just that Stars and Stripes thing about how wonderful everything is. Apparently, we have very few wounded, and we're winning. I mean, has anyone heard of the Tet Offensive back there? Saigon is getting crazy. Mortar attacks are something else, like an earthquake. It rocks buildings. You feel the earth moving under you. And maybe we shouldn't move out to California when I get home. Once, for three nights in a row, a chopper kept buzzing my house. Then it was gone. But for those three nights, I'd find myself running out onto the lawn in my nightdress, like it was a sign. Like they'd come with a message for me. Time to go back. The response to the sound of rotor blades is visceral. In your head, you know, they're probably just doing the traffic report. But that sound transports you, like there was no time at all in between. It's not a flashback exactly, but it takes a while to shake. I wonder sometimes how many nurses out there, starting the car, getting groceries, feel that pump, start to get ready just for a second. Incoming wounded. So, I get leave next Tuesday. Yahoo! Two weeks away from this crazy place. The rains are here now. Every day. Suddenly we're in the monsoons. Days are incredibly muggy, and then it just comes down. And when it does, everything breaks loose. Rivers flood. Rats float by. I wait for it. Sheets and sheets of rain. It pours down the walls of my room, warps everything. Look, Lois, 
about our trip. I don't really know if I'm going to make it back. None of us do. So there's something I want you to promise me. If I do die over here, I want you to go on our trip to all those places and write some notes and send postcards to my family about where we would be. That island off Africa called Majorca, M-A-J-O-R-C-A, I really want you to go, if that's okay with you. Promise. I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing. They briefed us on guerrilla warfare. You know, there is no front, there are fire zones, attack is arbitrary. But they assured us that medical personnel would never come under attack. Because we will have a big red cross on us wherever we go, which means hospitals are out of bounds. We're safe, like the DMZ. Because those are the rules of war. The Geneva Convention says so. Yeah, right. The rules. We're safe. Safe. It's bad here, Lois, no matter what they're saying. I got shot a while ago. I didn't tell you right away so you wouldn't get upset. I'm fine. It was during the Tet Offensive. I was out trying to get some blood for a guy and I saw a little kid, a boy I think, lying out in triage. He'd been hit. When I got to him I felt this thump and I went to my knees. I was so anxious to get out of the open, I didn't even know I'd been shot. It was a sniper. Dress code is hospital white, so we're like walking targets. It missed my spine by a sixteenth of an inch, a steel cap bullet that didn't lodge. We call it a through and through, a lot of blood no damage. One of the doctors loaned me a shirt and I just kept working. I'm fine, but whatever you're hearing back there, Lois, just please don't believe it. It's bad here, okay? Saigon has a bad, spooky feel. We're safe. Safe. July 1983, San Francisco. Bob and I are in Chinatown, dressed up to celebrate the Chinese New Year with Asian friends. We are chatting and laughing on our way to the restaurant. As I step from the curb, the fireworks begin. I go for cover. And then someone is helping me crawl out from underneath a parked car. My dress is filthy. They help me to my feet. No one knows what to say. I have no idea where I am. This is Tet. I'm still trying to pick up the pieces. So, yeah, being shot at is a spooky thing. I remember the first time it happened. Talk about green. We were landing in country at Tan San Nut, the big air base in Saigon. And as we went into our final descent, the aircraft went into this steep spiral. I thought we were crashing. Later we found out it's standard procedure when landing under fire. It's called a corkscrew. It was nighttime, and we could see these beautiful colored flashes of light below, and delicate pink trails drifting up towards us. Tracers and ground fire. Very pretty. Everyone was in a real hurry to get us off that plane. I have very little memory of what happened in Tonson Newt that night. Shades of brown, masses of people hurried onto military buses, and we were being fired on. How rude. Not a very nice way to welcome someone. I dream I'm running to the Claymore Hotel, a half block from the hospital. I'm trying to get up the five flights of stairs to my room, and the building explodes. Somehow, I land on the roof. Overhead, a gunship, ours, is firing on me. 
The pilot can't hear me. I'm screaming at him. I am a nurse. I'm an American. This is a hospital. Machine gun fire knocks me on my back. I'm bleeding out. With my finger, I draw a red cross in blood. The sign. I am a nurse. This is a hospital. We're safe. Safe. We're safe. We'll have a big red cross on us. Safe. So, these 19-year-olds in fatigues are pushing us onto the buses, yelling at us to get on the floor and stay down. And they have guns. M16s. Our duffel bags are on the seats, and we're sprawled under them, and I'm in nylons and heels, and it's very hot, and by now, the idea that you get on a bus to go someplace is taking a very different turn. I keep asking what's going on, and the answer comes back, those screens on the windows aren't there to keep mosquitoes out. They're there to screen grenades. But how would grenades get in here? People throw them in? But why? Why would they do that? So I'm lying on the floor of this bus so as not to present a head target in this little army uniform, summer weight greens, and we're banging over unpaved roads I'm dressed in this terrible color that drains my skin and makes me look jaundiced on this hurry, hurry bus ride to Long Bin, wherever that is. And I want to be an opera singer. And I'm trying to protect myself from being sprayed with bullets by people who I don't know. Why? Shrimp boats is a-coming. There's dancing tonight. Okay. One time. There's a man behind me on a bicycle. And that bad feeling on the street. It's an alert. Incoming. People are running. Scattering. Sometimes I carried a small handgun. Everything is moving quickly. I cross the street, trying to get to the Red Cross compound. Panic setting in. I think I killed him. But I've never been sure. I didn't look back. I'm on my way into Saigon. No longer familiar 28 years later. In the grip of powerful flashbacks, intense and relentless. We are on the last leg of a three-week tour, returning vets, and now I am hunting. For days I am in and out of delirium with a serious bout of amoebic dysentery. It can kill you. I don't want to die here, not in this country, and not like this. My civilian friends are with me, including one who romanticizes war. She wants me to talk about my past. She brings me orange juice and reads The Quiet American to me, sitting on the other bed, one block from the Continental Hotel. Not now, I tell her. Long after, when we are back in the U.S., she tells me that that day in the Saigon Hotel, I sat straight up in bed, transparent in my old black silk nightie that I can't throw away. She says I looked enormous. Fierce, the dragon lady, white with sickness, with rage. And I tell her most of the time, old men make wars, not young ones, and the young ones die, and it isn't glamorous. They die a long way from home, often for nothing, from alcohol poisoning, friendly fire, malaria, fragging, overdose, screaming for their mothers, and there is no background music. So, 
It's my second day in Vietnam, and I can't imagine 360 more like this. And I'm wondering if there's any way out. We're lined up against a wall in the processing center. I'm sick, probably from all the shots we had to take. I don't know what day it is or where we are. And there's all this noise outside, trucks, mortar rounds, weapons I couldn't identify then. And for the life of me, I'm looking up and down this line thinking, firing squad. I have on a beautiful black velvet evening gown. My hair is down. We are landing in a foreign country. We are taken to a big Quonset hut, and inside I can see there is no real stage, no audience. Frantically I tell them that they must find the chairs, set up the stage. There is no time left. We are giving a performance. Musicians file in, start to set up, tune their instruments. Behind me I hear the audience arriving. A full house. I turn to the orchestra, and their tuxedos are disintegrating into filthy fatigues. The instruments disappear, their sounds transforming into human voices. Fear. Desperately, I tell them I am here to sing. As I look out into the audience, Chairs transform into litters on the floor, with hundreds of men wailing and screaming for help. And still, I am assuring them, you've come to hear music. The air is hot and suffocating, filled with the stench of infection, dirt, blood. Why is there no singing and music in this place? Shrimp boats is a coming, their sails are in sight. Shrimp boats is a coming, there's dancing tonight. After the war, my boyfriend of twenty years tells me I sometimes sing that in my sleep, and sometimes he says he wakes to find me crouched over him, ready to attack, eyes wide open, sound asleep. Won't you hurry, hurry, hurry home? Won't you hurry, hurry, hurry home? Won't you hurry home? Won't you hurry home? Won't you hurry, 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 hurry home? Won't you hurry, hurry home? Okay, we're in January 1967. Welcome to Vietnam. The guy, my ride, didn't come for six hours. All I could do was wait. My poor duffel bag, I drag it back and forth in the hut, then outside and sit on it because there were creatures on the ground, you know bugs and things, none I approved of. Ultimately, I didn't even hear the thing, the jeep coming, lost in my efforts to tuck my damn pants into my boots. So I was bent over, backside to the door, trying to restore order when this guy comes in. And that's his first sight of me, rear end in the air, an image we later discussed and laughed over. There's a screeching door hinge, and I jerk up suddenly, swing around, and there's this long, cool drink of water, kind of strawberry blondish, very good-looking guy. He grins and says, you're the one I'm here to pick up. I said, I hope so. We laugh. And then we're in the Jeep driving along. He's pointing things out to me. 
and I feel him looking at me. He grins and says he was glad they weren't shipping nurses over by the pound and that I was the most gorgeous thing he'd seen in this country. He was adorable. And then in the distance, as we're approaching Saigon, we hear wailing and moaning, all this weeping. It's a funeral procession. Bright, bright colors, with a hearse of sorts, a very ornate litter, and all this amazing noise, musical instruments and singing, hired mourners, he says. Then he says, don't walk alone, but never walk in groups of more than three. Alone, you're an easy target, and three or more become a major target for a group grenade. Sometimes duds are lobbed in, or rocks, but often they're live grenades. Wow, how would you know? I don't know if he knew I was frightened. He just kept going. It's meant to undermine morale, shake us up, and don't kick anything. Step over it. You might blow up. News to me. See those cyclos going by? Those little carriages pushed by bicycles? They're taxis. Don't get in, ever. They pull up to a soldier, but especially someone who looks green. It's often an attractive Vietnamese woman, and she'll have a knife or a gun. Sometimes it's a man dressed up as a woman. Dragon ladies. Ever heard of them? They'll kill you. It happens all the time. He was giving me a life lesson, a one-minute how-to survival briefing, and then we're pulling up in front of this building, and he says, this is your quarters. I'm looking up at this crumbling, six-story concrete box surrounded by barbed wire and military police. He says, welcome to the Claymore Hotel. They call it the Claymore because one more Claymore mine could take it out. So there it was, my home away from home for the duration of my tour, the Claymore Hotel. Boats is a common, there's dancing too. This is one of those poems my mother never wanted me to read. 1968. Your hand trembles as you reach for mine, and I know you're beginning to leave me. Your cloudy eyes flutter as you look through me and ask for a drink. That is the sound of your final words. Your pale hands and feet grow colder as you slip into a deeper sleep. Your chest retracts with every breath, like an imploding volcano. Your body sucks desperately for air until the gurgle in your throat gives notice of the coming end. The thump of your heart slows to nothing. Your Adam's apple thrusts forward with a clicking, choking cough that is the sound of your final breath. Your pitiful bag of belongings is placed upon your chest in lieu of flowers. I close your eyes and hold them shut so I can't see the question. The slosh of water as I bathe you and the rip of tape as I change your dressings one last time. And then the slap of heavy plastic as I shake open the big black body bag. No matter your size, you look frail and tiny as I slide you inside, with a final look to check your records with your belongings, with your wristband, your toe tag. I determine that you leave with everything you brought, except your life. And now, the loudest sound, the zip of the body bag, as I shut you in your final cloak. But the zipper is not the final sound. There are the squeaking wheels of the gurney, the clash of metal against metal as you are pushed through the big steel doors, the grating wood of the litter as it's placed with a thud on the truck. The doors slam shut, the locks click, the gears grind, the tires rumble down the road. The chopper blades tell me you're on your way home. 
the sounds are relentless, halfway around the world. I hear the hymns sung in your remembrance, the choking sobs of your family, the shuffle of feet as friends pay their last respects, the scrape of your coffin against dirt as you're lowered into your grave, and the soft flap of cloth as the flag is folded and handed to your family. These are the final sounds for those who knew you, but for me, there is no final sound. There will always, always be the echo of your voice asking me, why? September 1967, beautiful downtown Saigon. Hi, Lois. It's midnight. I'm up on the roof of the Claymore Hotel. We suntan up here sometimes. There's a lot going on tonight. I couldn't sleep. I'm not supposed to be up here, but it's too hot in my room. The roof is flat, so you get a 360 of the Saigon skyline. Maybe I could do a radio program from up here. In front of me, I'm looking out at the helipad in a field that I used to walk in before I found out it was laced with landmines. Mm. <laughs> Won't you hurry, hurry, hurry home? Won't you hurry, hurry, hurry home? I dream I'm standing on the roof of the Claymore Hotel. It's dead of night. The sky is lit up with explosions. Cordite and dust choke the air, and people are running everywhere. The city is burning. We are in chaos. The noise is confounding. All the sounds of war conspire. Choppers, sirens, Rockets, mortars, Saigon is on fire. My hands are covering my ears against this fury, and I'm weeping, but there's no sound. And then I explode into flames. I'm kneeling close to the wall, bright DC sun, by the women's memorial, a day after the dedication ceremony. It's 1994, a warm November day, and I'm looking up at the bronze nurse who scans the sky for medevac choppers. Do you know that one? And behind me, a voice says, you used to wear your hair like that. I turn. It's a vet who unbelievably recognizes me, says my name, and tells me that during the war, as he's going into surgery, I tell him to look at my face because it will be the first thing he sees when he wakes up. He says the only thing he can think of is that he's bleeding on his snaps. He says, I tell him I'll take them and wipe off the blood and tape them to his bed rail so he'll see his family when he comes round. He was there, he says, the night I was shot. It was during Tet. We were under fire. And another night he woke to find me on top of him, with a lot of corpsmen around, because he'd gone into cardiac arrest. He says he came to the wall to find me, to say thanks. Max, his name is. I begin to remember. One night in Queen On, halfway up the coast, halfway through our tour, one of the women vets says she was stationed here during the war, that she wants to find her old hospital. She's hired a local driver to take her next morning before our bus leaves. We are staying in the old Mac 5 headquarters, and tonight we're eating in a little restaurant on the South China Sea. Waves are breaking on the beach. The family beside us is celebrating. 
Suddenly, all the lights go out, and I am halfway under the table, the others, veteran and civilian, going with me, before we see the sparklers on the cake. A birthday. This town has that old, bad feeling. At dawn, the nurse and her driver are lucky. They find it. Later on the bus, heading for Da Nang, she is weeping. All of them died, she says. They just all... They just... All... Died. The crew turns off the camera. I want to leave this place. Because I'm still trying to pick up the pieces. Saigon, December 1967. Remember I mentioned this kid Davy, the guy who likes music, and that I would sing to him? At one point, he asked me if he was going to die. It's always a judgment call when they ask you that. Some people don't want to know, but often you can tell if they really mean it, if they really want to know. Some people just need to know the worst, almost like they need to make a decision. It could be, who do I leave my sneakers to? Really, it might be that simple. David was with us for quite a while, and it seemed to me that he wanted to know. So I told him that he was very, very ill, and that it looked like he might not make it. After a bit, he asked if he died on my shift, would I stay with him? And it turned out to be on my shift. So it was about two o'clock in the morning. I could tell that he was sinking. Different deaths have different signs. He was real weak, but he asked me if it was almost time, and I said yes. Then he asked for his songs, one last time. So what I did was kind of crawl up onto the bed with him and take him in my arms, and then I sang his two songs to him. If I loved you, and then I'll be seeing you. And at the end of I'll be seeing you, he died. It's a beautiful spring twilight in San Francisco. Bob and I are on our way to hear a whole evening of show tunes and big band music. We're very excited. The production is designed as a big radio station with a full swing band. We walk into a huge Quonset hut. The brass section is warming up. It's wonderful. Halfway through the performance, I suddenly realize I'm standing, stumbling over feet, moving towards the stage. The band is playing I'll Be Seeing You. I'm weeping, and I can't remember why. be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. January 1968, Saigon. Hi, Lois. I'm out in the cemetery near the hospital. I'm a little preoccupied with death right now. I can't shake it, Lois. I mean, it's one thing to sing somebody to sleep, but to sing somebody to death. I'm glad I was with Davy, and I'm glad he got what he wanted, given that he asked for so little at the end like that. It was a good thing to do. But something about him is haunting me, Lois. Maybe it's just that he represents everybody and everything that's going on over here. These young kids. It just seems so sad. I mean, I'm only a year or two older than most of them, but... What a waste. I can't write home about it. I can't talk with anybody about it. You can't think about it all the time or you'd go crazy. You can't let the patients know that you're scared or what you're feeling, other than compassion. 
you always have to have your act together. And it's hard to know when you'll ever get a moment to talk about this. And if you do, what can we do about it? Not much. You're the only one who ever really asks. Anyway, I'd like to let Davy go now. This is such a nice little cemetery. It's so peaceful here. You can't hear the war from here. They're building a huge Buddha over in the temple. And the graves are like chairs in the way they seem to be set up. I asked one of the monks about it, and he told me it was so that the person can sit up in the afterlife and be comfortable. The monks are so kind. Travel swift and safe, Davy. Won't you hurry home? If I love to him. Departure is a strange time. Everyone is working on their tans. People wanting to take you to dinner in Saigon. But there's never any time. Everyone pretty much works right up into the last minute. And suddenly they're gone. No big emotional upheaval. No final snapshot. There's a lot of apprehension. Everyone knows it can all go south. Usually everyone leaving a war is deeply superstitious. The odds seem to get bad, fast. I was on a medevac, and a kid hitched a ride with us. He was short one day, and the pilot told him we had to make a stop in a fire zone. But he didn't want to wait around for another chopper. He just wanted to get out. Shrapnel hit the rotor blades. A piece came flying through the open door, and he was decapitated. So you don't hope too much. As we're pulling away, some folks come out to wave. Jostling in the truck. A very different person leaving. How much time has elapsed? What happened to me? I wanted to sing. November 11th, 1990. The Wall. A letter. Unfinished, stuffed in my journal. General Westmoreland, I have a question for you. What would you say to them? Stiff upper lip? Job well done? Your country thanks you? Supreme sacrifice? I guess people who claim to be warriors need to find a war. But are you and your political pals ready to play your own game instead of conscripting other people's kids for fodder? General Westmoreland, I'm wondering if you've noticed by now that the thing about war is there's a disagreement, then you fight, then there's an agreement. How about getting rid of the middle step in there? It would save so many of us medical people breaking the Hippocratic Oath so often. Why did you lie? What would you say to Davy? You know what I think you'd say? Nothing. I don't think you'd say anything at all. Because if you'd seen what I did, we did, every day, this would all end. Now. It's almost the end of the 20th century. And we're driving up Highway 1, through Nha Trang, Mi Lai, Da Nang, and on up the coast to Hue, the Perfume River. This country, haunted, haunting beauty. In the Highlands, late afternoon, we stop to wander through an old temple. The sun sinks quickly here into dark blue velvet hills jungle. At dusk, the wind comes up, a hot tropical wind. We hang around the tour bus, waiting for stragglers. I know I'm not the only one flashing back, but none of us speak. This is a night wind, dangerous, exotic, filled with memory, 
filled with dreams. Twenty-eight years later, during our final supper, overlooking the Saigon River on the balcony of the Majestic Hotel, unrecognizable now to those of us who'd come before, I tell them of last night's dream, that I've found what I've come for. In the dream, a young girl is outside looking through the window, and I am looking back. Her face is too old to be this young. I let her know I've been looking for her for a long, long time. She is confused, alert. I tell her that the war is over and I have come to take her home. Won't you hurry, 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 hurry home? Won't you hurry, hurry home? Won't you hurry? Home? Won't you hurry, 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 hurry home? Won't you hurry, 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 hurry home? Won't you hurry, hurry home? Won't you hurry, hurry home? No background music was written by Normie Noel and based on the Vietnam stories of Penny Rock. It was performed by Sigourney Weaver and directed and produced by Gregory Whitehead. The executive producer was Gordon House.